hey guys welcome back we're here with another video and today i'm stuck in toronto rush hour traffic which is horrendous and usually i'm not the one to go you know hop in rush hour traffic i would try to avoid it at all costs but you know a couple times a year it's kind of inevitable and you just got to go right in there and suck it up so without further ado as you guys can see with the title of this video i'm not here to bash toyota but let's face it they made some pretty remarkable engines one being the beams engine in the altezza hopefully i'm saying that name right and a hot take i think the beams version i do believe the beams version is the two liter i think that's better suited to the car than the 2j because i i'm not sure what the base engine was for the lexus version i know it's not the beams engine or i might be mistaken but i do know the other engine option was that straight six that 2j just not uh, i just think it's cool but i just don't think it suits that body i might be crazy for saying that you know if you want to build a sleeper build go right ahead i'm all for that but i do think the beams engine kind of suits this car's character a little bit more it's an excellent rear wheel drive chassis it's got a nice silky smooth engine now to understand this rivalry between honda and toyota we'll have to go all the way back to the mid 80s with the a86 corolla now this old ass corolla that i mentioned has such a cult like following they even got to me at one point in time like i wanted one of those like personally if i were to choose between the two body styles I'll take mines in two-door Trueno form. You know, having watched Initial D, you know, in the final stage where Takumi is paired up with Shinji, it's probably one of the most intense battles in the entire series. It's like Takumi is facing his younger self, like he did in the beginning with a stock Corolla, with just a face it with just a few basic handling modifications. Now, going back to reality, the A86 is more of a handling slash momentum car with a pretty standard engine. In its highest spec, the 1.6 blue top, well, I can't even speak today, blue top 4A GE engine only made about 110, 112 horsepower, and the Japanese models made about 128 horsepower, and that was due to the fact that it was a map-based sensor system compared to the, I think it was um, AFM for the American slash um, Canadian one, because you know we had to deal with emissions and stuff like that. Um, now, if we go back and look at the actual physical engine itself, at the intake plenum here, you could see there's a TVIS badge on the plenum. This was basically a variable intake system, which improved performance down in the lower rev range. Not anything groundbreaking, but they had a little flair and sporty nature about it. This would later evolve into the red top, which would be the most powerful version of this motor, making a total of 140 horsepower. These early motors were extremely popular with tuners, mainly for their simplicity and excellent aftermarket support at the time. And yes, these can take a little boost too, but not too much because you'll blow that shit up. <laughs> Now, switching over to Honda, the new fourth generation Civic was just over the horizon with the legendary B16A. Toyota had released at the time a supercharged Corolla. And yes, you heard me correctly, a supercharged Corolla. This was only a Japan car called the GTZ. And the GTZ trim was basically available in both Levin and Trino form. They both received that, they both received the GTZ treatment. Now it had a unique engine and it had a own it had its own designation for it. The designation being the 4A G Z E. Z E probably for supercharged was basically a supercharged version of the 4A G engine. It's quite a bit different internally. It came with upgraded pistons that were dish, forged, and coated. It eliminated the archaic T Viz system in favor of the supercharged hardware because I do know when you're installing superchargers, they do require a different intake manifold. That's just how it is. And the Gen 1 version of this motor made about 143 horsepower. Generation 2 made 163 horsepower with a higher 8.9 to 1 compression ratio, a smaller supercharger pulley. Yeah, smaller. I, I thought, you know, bigger supercharger pulleys make more power, but hey, what do I know? And that provided 10 pounds of boost. And the final version, the Gen 3, came with 168 horsepower thanks to the small port cylinder head. Now, this sounds all pretty good, right? Toyota has covered every loophole to take on Honda's B16A. Now, wait a minute. 
wasn't this a VTech video? Shouldn't I be mentioning the NSX or the S2000? Uh, I kind of feel like um, the rivalry between the Civic and Corolla, it's kind of best shown here a little bit more because, um, you know, Honda and Toyota did have, you know, did have some pretty good rear wheel drive vehicles, but, you know, they were just way too, they were just two completely different philosophies. But the Corolla and Civic were fierce. It's probably even fiercer than STI and EVA, which is kind of crazy because we would consider those two to be pretty fierce rivals amongst the JDM cars. Now, when the B16A came out, it came out with a force that completely demolished its competition. But hold up. Do you remember that third gen 4A GZE that I mentioned earlier on and how it made nearly 170 horsepower? Now, Toyota is usually the conservative one when compared to Honda, Honda being the more sporty one. This was one of the few times that Toyota retaliated perfectly. The GTZ defeated the EF9 Civic and CRX SIR. This didn't really hold for too long as Honda was now just bringing out the eight series of engines, you know, coming into the 90s here, most notably the H22A, in which its earlier versions made about 200 horsepower and later iterations making about 220 horsepower. Now, these are two different class of car, you know, the Prelude being the much grown up one compared to the Corolla, but if we put them side by side here, they look pretty similar in size to me, to be honest. Now, the supercharged version demonstrated its acceleration. Honda would unleash its next move shortly, but before we get to that, we kind of have to talk about the GOAT of the 4AGE, and this would be the fourth generation 4AGE, which was known as the Silver Top. This was pretty much the first time Toyota introduced its variable valve timing system. The 20 valve 4AGE more so competed with the B16A in the EG EK Civic S Air Hydrox, not the Type R, because that was just a little bit too crazy. Um, this car, this motor, more so competed with that model, and it was right in line of them. And this is where I would pretty much consider peak Honda and peak Toyota when it comes to rivalry. Like both cars offered pretty much a pretty close experience. And yes, both these cars revved all the way to 8,000 RPM, which was unbelievable at the time. Toyota revving all the way to eight, that's unheard of. Usually Toyota is the more conservative, economical one, no matter what. And you know, this rivalry still continues to this day, you know, with the GR Corolla and the Civic Type R, but you know, those are a little bit too expensive. Now, there was a fifth generation version of this engine dubbed the Blacktop. It didn't have as much changes as the fourth generation and it only made about five horsepower more, 163 versus 158. In later iterations of this car, the Corolla Coupe specifically, it could be paired with a six speed manual transmission, which was pretty cool because the Civic was still on a five speed towards the end of the 1990s. Now, this is all you guys have been waiting for. Honda had released its Type R line of cars, starting off with the NSX Type R, Integra Type R, and the Civic Type R. These cars were just on a whole other level of performance and kind of took the spotlight again from Toyota. But in all fairness, the 4A GE is a brilliant engine and the Corolla where, you know, it was a brilliant engine and again this competes better with the lower grade civic sir as the b16a that came in that car made around the same horsepower about 170. the integra was the new sports coupe so it more competed with cars like the celica toyota rally toyota already had its two liter 3s gte which was pretty good and it competed with Honda very good and it actually was even faster than the B18C1 that came in an Integra which was pretty sweet but it was not enough to defeat the Type R version of that motor. Toyota did have a four-wheel drive version of the Celica which made about 250 horsepower but can we really call it a win despite how legendary the Celica GT4 was it needed four-wheel drive and force induction just to beat Honda. You know, you guys take your pick. Now, while the Celica GT4 was good, that would be quickly be those that spot would be quickly taken by the STI and Evo. And you know, 
again, it was a legendary car, but unfortunately, it was left behind and forgotten. Now, in 1999, this is where everything changes. Toyota would release a duo that would finally give Honda a run for its VTEC system, the new Celica GTS, alongside the Toyota Altesa. Powering the Celica is the 1.8 liter 2ZZ GE, which made anywhere from 170 horsepower all the way up to 200 horsepower in a vast array of models and trims. But this engine is mostly known for Toyota's VTEC or VVTI, which stands for Variable Valve Timing with Intelligence. This gave drivers a little boost of power like VTEC without the need of turbocharging hardware. The high performance cam was activated at 6200 RPM compared to Honda's 5800 RPM. Now, the only drawback to this system was the acceleration window was just simply too short, you know, when the lift activated, you know, up in the high rev range. Now, the Altezza was a rear wheel drive platform, which was pretty interesting at the time because Honda didn't have much rear wheel drive offerings outside of the NSX and S2000. The Beams 3S GTE was a super high rev was a super high rev engine that had dual VVTI and that made around 210 horsepower and it offered a nice entry level enthusiast compact sedan that wasn't front wheel drive. But in typical Toyota fashion, it was a terrific handling chassis with good feedback, but the acceleration was just painfully slow compared to its main rivals. Although the Altezza was a blend of sportiness and luxury packed into one, Toyota did have a couple things up its sleeves for its next generation of cars. Honda was just about to release their K-Series, and Toyota at this time didn't have much to retaliate with. Toyota came out with the Corolla and Matrix XRS respectively, which in my opinion was much better than the 7th generation Civic Si slash Civic SIR, if, SIR if you live in Canada. Now, that car received the base RSX engine, the K20A3. That made about 160 horsepower, and you guys can fight me this in the comments. I don't care. That car did not have real VTEC. Meanwhile, the Matrix XRS would satisfy your valve timing cravings. And if you didn't like that hatchback, you could get yourself that in a Corolla, which, again, which was the Corolla XRS. That had the same 2ZZ GE engine from the Celica. And also, if you want an even more rewarding experience, if you were just like, screw front wheel drive, this engine could also be found in the Lotus Elise. Now, during this time, the Acura RSX was released, both the base and the Type S. Despite the 2ZZ GE being extremely capable and being able to hold boost quite a bit better than the past engines, I can just hear Toyota fans just hitting me in the head right now. The K20 and K24 took off like a frenzy. Everyone was swapping these into all the Hondas as if, you know, pretty much because they were more agile, they provided better acceleration and handling just from the lighter weight bodies. There's good examples of Corollas built making high horsepower, just like this one. But, you know, it's not, you know, you don't really, the ratio, you know, you probably see eight K-series builds and probably two Corolla builds. And, you know, the numbers are more in favor with the K-series. Sadly, Toyota ended this rivalry with the next generation Corolla Matrix going back to their conservative ways because enthusiasts were just a small, simple group of people. It's a very niche group, and that's not a volume seller. The XRS trims came with the 2AZ FE, making around 160 horsepower, and there wasn't really anything remarkable about this engine, and by this time, the 8th generation Civic Si was coming out, and it was no longer a contest. Toyota did have a go again by creating the Corolla Apex, but it was more so the same recipe that had been Toyota had been doing for years. Excellent chassis, but the motor was lacking in character. I believe the regular Corollas, you know, made about 160 horsepower, and the Apex made about 170. Like, literally, that could have been such a perfect competitor to the Civic Si. It kind of is in some ways, but it is down on power. And I just don't think that will fly this time in modern day and ages. 
you know, unfortunately, Toyota had moved out of this space and Honda kept its dominance and still gave us a taste of what high revving, you know, naturally aspirated engines were. And sadly, all these great Toyota engines, you know, Toyota's VVTi, they were pretty much often forgotten, pretty much in favor of Honda's K-Series. And it's really a damn shame how Toyota kind of just left it. They could have pretty much went all the way up, up to the ninth generation Civic Side. They could have had a crazy motor. It, it, it would have just been cool to have like one more choice because, you know, Honda was in that space. Honda gave you that experience. Um, there were other manufacturers that did release their own um, variable valve timing systems, such as Mitsubishi had one. I think this was called Myvec. Nissan was always confusing to me. I think theirs is called Neo VVL, something like that. And um, I think there were other manufacturers that had their own too, but, but like if there is some that I'm missing, you know, please mention it down in the comments. But yeah, that's pretty much why I think, you know, Toyota's variable valve timing didn't really take off. It just wasn't as harmonic as Honda's and also in culture, you know, everyone talks about Honda's. You don't really hear too much about these cars anymore. It's really a damn shame if you ask me.